Добрый день. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. We are happy to welcome you at the press center of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to this joint briefing by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Defense of the Russian Federation, as well as the Ministry of Trade and Commerce of the Russian Federation. Our topic for today is Russian uh, estimations of the seventh report of the United Nations OPCW Jim. Uh, that uh, attributed the responsibility of the use of Syrian to Damascus, to the Syrian Arab Republic. We will start with the addressing word by the representatives of the Minister of Foreign Affairs, of the Minister of Trade and Commerce, and the Minister of Defense. Then we will open up for questions. You will need to raise up your hand, and we will give you the floor. Please. Uh, N name yourself and then I'll proceed with your question. Our working language is Russian, and if you need interpretation, please use the simultaneous interpretation devices. Okay, now I will give the floor to one of our panel members, is the head of the de Department of Arms Control and Non Proliferation of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It's Mr. Mikhail Ulyanov. Mr. Ulyanov, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, dear guests. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Well, judging by the turnout, I can see that uh, this event has stirred much interest, and that is quite understandable, because it is a hot-button issue, and we believe that in the weeks to come, at the Security Council in New York and at the Executive Council of OPCW in The Hague. Well, there will be much debate, uh, much diplomatic debate on this topic. As you know, on the 26th of October, the G UN OPCW GIM issued its seventh report focused on uh, two alleged uh, use of chemical weapons in Syria. It focuses on two episodes, one in Umhosh in, uh, in September of 2016 uh, and in Han Sheikhun on the 4th of April this year. Uh, as for Umhosh, uh, Jim attributed the responsibility for the use of sulfur master to ISIS, and as for Han Shehun, it attributed responsibility to the to the official Damascus. Okay, now in the run up to uh, to the discussions of this uh, report in the Security Council and. Uh, in the OPCTW, we would like to share our perspective on this issue. So I would like to start that uh, emphasizing the following. There are m m many insinuations in the Western media regarding Russian stance on this issue. They are quite harsh, and sometimes they are even deceiving or misleading. So I would like, uh, firstly, to emphasize that Russia firmly condemns any use of chemical weapons by any of our actors and in any part of the world. We have consistently advocated for identifying individuals responsible for such incidents, and we believe that they have to be held responsible. That's why we have backed the Security Council Resolution 2235, establishing uh, the joint investiga investigative mechanism, and moreover, Russia was one of the pen holders of this resolution. Well, naturally, we hoped that uh, the GIM and the f fact finding mission of the OPCW will work impartially and highly professionally. Uh, and all its investigations will be of high quality in order to identify those who are responsible for those chemical incidents. Well, unfortunately, I would like to say that the reality didn't live up to those expectations. We received the first wake-up call um, a bit more over than a year ago when Jim issued a report blaming Damascus that allegedly uh, used chemical uh, weapons 
on three occasions. It said about chlorine. So one of this episode is uh, is based on a really fairy tale scenario, and I would like just to share it with you. Well, allegedly, a military helicopter belonging to the Syrian air forces from a very high altitude dropped a barrel filled with chlorine that got directly into a ventilation shaft of a residential home uh, with uh, the and this shaft had the same diameter as this barrel so can you imagine that i cannot do it myself and uh, um, the interesting thing is that the report itself said that this scenario was improbable former head of GM, while presenting this report uh, in the security council of the united nations said that it was uh, very improbable. Uh, nevertheless, Damascus was blamed for this incident. And so now, now on any occasion, the media are repeating that uh, Jim, being impartial and highly professional, on three occasions uh, attributed the blame and the responsibility for those three chemical an incidents to Syrian authorities. So I have repeatedly asked my colleagues, so what is the mathematical probability of uh, this barrel, chlorine-filled barrel, getting into this ventilation shaft? Um, even e so it probably would stuck on the roof because the trajectory of its fall is not a vertical line. So I have asked my colleagues about the mathematical probability of this scenario. It's one to million. However, my colleagues refused to answer saying that they were not well versed in mathematics. So the fact that uh, joint investigative mechanisms um, issued a conclusion that contradicts the basic f physics and ballistic law. They just don't give a damn about it. Uh, we, uh, there have been some uh, um, f fault uh, conclusions. Uh, in April, uh, uh, Russia submitted uh, a draft uh, resolution to the ex Executive Council of OPCW that uh, suppo supposed um, sending s uh, experts of um, OPCW to Han Shehun and Syrian air base Shirad, where, according to some countries, uh, the uh, aircraft uh, with uh, chemical weapons uh, took off. Uh, however, a number of countries blocked this uh, proposition and very soon we noticed that uh, this uh, stance uh, by the western countries has been accepted by the fact finding mission as well as the joint investigative mechanism so they refused to visit Han Shehun and Al Shirat Air Base FFM said that it was impossible due to the lack of necessary security provisions. Later, it turned out that it was untrue. On the 4th of October this year, under the Security Council of the United Nations, uh, the head of uh, security issues of the United Nations Secretariat, and this is one of the branches that is in charge of uh, security issues of international personnel. And um, he said that uh, the security of the personnel coming to this uh, to this um, sites could be ensured. However. Uh, FFM uh, didn't uh, didn't want to go there. That's why they acted remotely. I think it is scandalous because we can see that it is an attempt to mislead, to disorient the international community. FFM decided not to come there, saying that it was well beyond its mandate and it was uh, within the mandate of the gym. However, something similar happened to the gym because that despite our calls uh, insist that we have issued repeat repeatedly to check uh, the 
traces of sarin at the air base um, in Al Shirat, they said that it was beyond its mandate, so they were passing the buck on uh, not fulfilling their responsibilities. As a result, uh, Jim visited uh, this airbase, if I'm not mistaken, on the 8th of October. However, um, its expert categorically refused to collect uh, samples there in order to identify the traces of serine in there. And that is, uh, despite the fact that this um, expert group brought together um, chemists and they had, uh, and there were there was some necessary equipment in Damascus. Well, I think that it looks like just a plain sabotage to me. I would like to emphasize that we never requested from these mechanisms anything that was beyond their mandate and uh, beyond their provisions of the Chemical Weapons Convention. Um, we insisted on, um, on the following, that um, in the framework of this investigation you have to use all possible methods and means um, enshrined in this convention, uh, which means the following, the sample collecting as well as um, on-site uh, eyewitnesses investigation. Well, I think this is just some these are basic things, especially when you talk about uh, such a responsible and sensitive issue, uh, like in attributing the responsibility in identifying the individuals or actors responsible for this chemical incidents. However, um, those missions um, turned a blind eye to our calls, and they were carrying out their work remotely, in New York, in, in The Hague, as well as um, in one of the neighboring countries with Syria. Well, they couldn't, it couldn't but influence the quality of the report, and it resulted to be f of very low quality. Uh, I would like to say that FFM uh, violated the basic chain of custody principles principle that is enshrined in its mandate. This principle is provided for in the Chemical Weapons uh, Convention as well as other documents of the OPCW. And uh, it says that the representatives of this organi organization have to collect samples uh, at the impact site and have to make sure they're kept well s uh, safe until they are analyzed in a chemical laboratory. Actually, they obtain the samples from the Syrian opposition forces and groups on the territory, I repeat, of one of the neighboring countries with Syria. Almost the same goes for eyewitnesses questioned initially by the FFM and then additionally by the employees of Jim. There are no confirmations that these people were actually in Han Hun on the morning of the 4th of April when the incident took place. Accordingly, we cannot use their testimonies as basis for the investigation. Such an approach by the Jim and the FFM can hardly be called professional. As a result, the so-called proof that they accumulated was unconvincing. It is not accidental that almost every page of the report contains such words as possibly, probably, can suppose, that, most likely, and so on. Such words are unacceptable for a report which wants to be a truthful and detailed one. It would be better to report to the UN Security Council that under the current conditions Jim cannot conduct a high-quality investigation. During the investigation we witnessed other miracles which surprised us. For example, for some reason the mission of the OPCW for thinks that its goal is to decide whether chemical weapons were used or not. All the rest, as they said, was n not in its mandate. Such an interpretation of mandate contradicts the pertinent decisions of the Executive Council of the o 
PCW, fully supported in paragraph 5 of Resolution 2209 of the United Nations Security Council. Actually, the mandate of the FFM in accordance with the decisions is much broader. It consists in examining all the available information on the claims on the use of chemical weapons in Syria. The mission, in fact, refused to do that. That explains its refusal to visit the Shairat Air Base. So, FFM thinks it has the right to define its mandate on its own, even contradicting the decisions of the directive authorities. Another example, in accordance with the Convention on Chemical Weapons, Syria has the right to demand and to obtain part of the samples which were collected on its territory in the site of the supposed use of chemical weapons. But so far, OPCW Technical Secretariat has not reacted to the demand of Damascus. It only gives promises to provide the samples, al although partially. This is a direct violation of the Convention. And there are many examples of this kind. But let us uh, proceed to the seventh report and our evaluations. We think that the report does not go deep. It is not professional. It's amateur work. I give you a single example. As I have already said, one of the episodes investigated by the mechanism was the incident in Umhosh, where uh, mustard gas was used. This investigation was initiated by Syria and Russia, who drew the attention of the organization to it. Our military visited the incident site and found used mustard gas projectile, which was passed to the OPCW for analysis and examination. Using this analysis, Jim drew the conclusion that mustard gas was really used during the hostilities between ISIS and other armed groups opposing it. The responsibility for this crime was laid on ISIS. You know why? The report states that ISIS is to blame because the other side was never known for using mustard gas. Such arguments strike us and it does not indicate their high professionalism. As for Han Sheikhun, the proof basis of uh, Damascus' blame is provided as three main blocks in the report. Let us proceed to the report itself. First, it is information on the version that the sarin charge air bomb was supposedly dropped from a uh, Syrian military airplane uh, passing in not far from Han Sheikhoun on the morning of the 4th of April. The second block, analysis of photo and video materials from the incident site, first of all connected with the explosion crater. And the third block, analysis of the chemical contents of sarin, the traces of which were located on the crime site. I will uh, ask the representatives of uh, the Defense Ministry to s give speeches on each of these blocks. We will start with uh, the aviation block. Thank you. Dear ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Upon studying the presented materials, I can see several moments which do not allow us to draw a conclusion that chemical weapons in the form of an air bomb were used and dropped from the Su-22 airplane of the Syrian Arab Republic. The airplane of the Syrian Air Force Su-22 can perform bombings by visual contact with the target, meaning from the altitude of no more than 4,000 meters. And targeting is performed by maneuvering and uh, taking a direct course to the target. Slide number one, please. 
On this slide you can see the actual flight paths of the planes of the Syrian Arab Republic on the 4th of April 2017 from 6 hours 37 minutes to 6 hours 46 minutes local time. These planes were observed by the coalition airspace control systems. Paragraph 30 of the report of Jim says that upon analyzing the presented materials and studying the testimonies, Jim drew a conclusion. The plane did not approach Han Shi Hun by less than five kilometers. In case of bomb dropping during horizontal flight at speeds from 800 to 1000 kilometers per hour at the altitude of up to 4000 meters, the bomb release point is located in the range of 1000 to 5800 5, meters from the target. Slide number two, please. On this slide, you can see the results of the calculation of the air bomb drop range at the speed of 800 kilometers per hour and the altitude of 3,500 meters. Under these conditions of bomb dropping, the range of uh, the bomb release is located at 5,500 meters from the target. But, slide number three, please. After releasing the bomb, the plane continues moving in the airspace. And even when performing the breakaway maneuver, it would have crossed the target line or significantly approached it. Since the turning radius in this case would uh, be from 3 to 9 kilometers, which contradicts the observation of the plane nearby Han Sheihun at a distance of no closer than 5 kilometers. Moreover, when performing maneuvers at high roll angles, and during climb, the plane would require thrust reserves and therefore high engine load up to the point of after burning. Such power settings of the plane engines are accompanied by loud noises and they could not be left unnoticed. In case of performing toss bombing with angles up to 60 degrees, the plane would need to dive directly on target and cross the target line during pullout which contradicts the testimonies who did not see the plane over Han Sheihun. Moreover, nowhere does the report say that the air bomb had a stabilizer, meaning in the bottom part of the air bomb, which would directly confirm the presence of a crater after the air bombing, although it is commonly known that during explosions of uh, high explosive fragmentation and non-fragmentation air bombs, the stabilizer is always there and can be located in the detonation area. Therefore, I think that the presented materials are inconclusive with the use of chemical weapons in Han Sheihun in the form of an air bomb dropped from Su-22 plane of the Syrian Air Force that performed the flight on the 4th of April 2017 from 6 hours 30 minutes to 7 hours at the range of uh, 5 kilometers, which excludes any technical possibility of a bomb strike against this town. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. No, I have... Uh, an education in humanities, so uh, I have a hard time understanding the technicalities. So I will just say a couple of words of explanations. If the plane was uh, following the flight path, which was uh, stated by the United States, that you can see on the slides, then it technically could not perform a strike against Han Sheihun. Therefore, the main version of the report of Jim it stands no criticism, it was technically impossible to do. And uh, a second aspect that I would like to underline. If it were an air bomb, then there would likely be this stabilizer in the crater. This uh, occurs always in 100% of the cases. 
there was no stabilizer on the site of the incident. It was not seen on any of the photos. It can be seen on any of the videos. So, the question arises. Why did Jim address and ask for help from anonymous foreign research centers and the so-called independent experts, as they call them in the report, instead of addressing the Russian Federation, keeping in mind that the plane Su-22 was produced in our country and no one knows its characteristics and capabilities better than us. That was a serious mistake by Jim, and therefore Jim made a fool of itself, and its accusations against Damascus turned out to be inconclusive. This is proved by a technical analysis, an objective and impartial analysis of what you have just seen on the slides. We cannot go against physics. These are not our simple discussions or suppositions. This is objective reality. I think such confusion uh, is the result of Jim's bet on the so-called aviation version of the incident. We have seen this when uh, we heard questions from Jim in August and September this year. Well, the version of the staged character and nature of the incident in Han Shei Hun that we suggested for examination was in fact ignored by Jim and once again on absolutely ridiculous grounds since the report says that they did not find any eyewitnesses to see the militants of local terrorist groups preparing and performing explosions on the ground. Can you take this argument seriously? It is clear that such provocations will never be performed in the presence of numerous eyewitnesses. All this is usually done in secret. Our analysis of the photo and video materials has shown that Jim should not take light, uh, so lightly the version that the, the incident in Han Shehun was staged but resulted in tragic consequences. I once again invite a representative of the Defense Ministry to speak on this topic. Uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues and friends. Uh, the crater form and the debris present at the slide here Any projectile placed on the ground creates the so-called impact zone. The zones of uh, dangerous uh, shaking. And at the same time, it uh, creates the zones uh, of uh, ground uh, uh, throwings. So, and the crater is usually of a circular or elliptic form, depending on uh, the uh, projectile. On this picture, we can see distinctly a rectangular edge of the crater. This is the first fact. And at these, uh, in this picture, we can see fragged uh, and uh, plastered edges uh, of uh, this uh, crater. This testifies that the projectile was placed on the ground. And we do not see any rock debris around this place. I would ask you to look at the second table. Any cylindrical 
ammunition, when it is uh, de detonated, has three sprays of debris. From this uh, head part, it has 20 percent. From uh, the, uh, the casing, it has 70 percent. And from the bottom, it emanates 10 percent, generates 10 percent of the degree. Under the condition that it is on a static condition and that it is placed on the surface. So let's look at the picture. We have uh, the very picture on the ground. We have two sprays uh, from this side and have opposite sprays from the head and from the bottom, which gives uh, us a reason to say that the projectile was placed on the ground. It ha was in a static position. In this picture, we can see two other factors. These are two major fragments on the sides. From uh, the head of the rim and from other sides. So this shows that the burst, the burst of charge was weakened in these parts. So we have just small fragments here. And therefore, we can conclude that it was a rectangular projectile s placed statically on the ground, which was placed on the rims that was uh, accompanied by metal fragments. The analysis performed when demining and analyzing uh, the impact shows that at the moment when the bomb hit the ground at the velocity of this contact of uh, 277 meters per second, the energy released is the following, like in the picture. So this is uh, the effect of the heavy fragments, heavy debris. We see here the table showing aerial bombs presented by relevant organizations. The weight of each bomb is six, 650 kilograms and diameter of 500 uh, meters. And uh, the uh, burst of charge is five kilograms. The second bomb is uh, 350 kilograms. Uh, the burst charge uh, three and a half uh, kilograms and the diameter is uh, 660 uh, meters. After the bomb hit the ground, there is uh, a specific channel formed which is present on in the table. The diameter it corresponds to the diameter of the bomb. It is 100 percent that there would be elements of the bomb buried in this channel that we do not see in the present picture. There are none. So we do not have p uh, this channel here. All aerial bombs uh, are designed uh, in uh, highly qu high quality steel. And uh, the while detonated, they are split into small fragments. And the exception only is uh, the tail fins. So we have uh, a metal uh, strip here. And uh, this is this uh, shows uh, that this uh, metal is quite flexible, which is uh, used uh, for 
for the design of the tubes. So this uh, is, uh, man means that this uh, projectile was uh, made of uh, this kind of tube and then placed on the ground. The conclusions of the gym joint investigative uh, mechanism, they are all deficient. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to give the floor to another uh, representatives of the Ministry of Defense, who is uh, military uh, chemi ch ch chemist. Uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues. Uh, in the report, uh, we have uh, results of the chemical analysis provided uh, by special uh, laboratories accredited by the OPCW. Uh, if uh, the fact of uh, the existence of uh, serine and its precursors is out of question, then a number of uh, circumstances uh, raises uh, some doubt. Jim uh, states that serine in uh, the samples in Han Shui Hun was uh, produced with the using of the DF precursor. Fra taken from the uh, primary stockpile of the Syrian Ara Arab, Arab Republic. According to the expert of the Ministry of the uh, Defense, this is uh, deficient and uh, we it is uh, based on the analysis of DF samples mm, taken uh, by the OPCW 2014 from the SARS, SARS stockpiles. And uh, there were impurities of uh, PF6 uh, and isopyl phosphate. These uh, impurities uh, were revealed by the laboratories in the samples uh, taken from uh, uh, the creators, from the creator. This, uh, the release of the mark marker chemicals and the uh, Revealing is not enough. Uh, the S the F PF6 is not an independent uh, compound. It can only be seen uh, with acid uh, or salts and metals. So we do not see how it was uh, revealed and it percent in uh, the samples. In uh, paragraph 85-87, it is uh, noted that FPF6 uh, uh, can be used uh, by uh, by using hydrofluoride, uh, but not any other agent. It is uh, well known uh, that uh, hexafluorium uh, hexafluoride can be used uh, uh, by fluorating uh, the uh, phosphorus uh, uh, chloride uh, hydrates. And uh, the use of such uh, techniques uh, does not uh, require high level of uh, expertise. Uh, the esphotoridite the and phosphates, uh, the uh, presence is uh, connected uh, to the other chemicals. And uh, but this can be a byproduct of uh, serine and uh, when using other technologies. Uh, on the above, uh, uh, basing on the above, uh, uh, the use of uh, isophthoridates and is a uh, uh, is uh, can be seen as uh, unfounded. In a paragraph 84, uh, there is a statement that the results of the ecological uh, samples uh, from Han Shui Hun uh, proves uh, the production of serine by uh, binary uh, technique, uh, with the reference uh, to uh, the uh, the fi finding mission materials. But there is no information there. 
and uh, there is a possibility of uh, uh, synthesis of uh, DF uh, with uh, the use uh, of the techniques uh, well known um, outside the OPCW and other uh, other organizations uh, for the compromising of the authorities of uh, the Syrian Republic. As uh, for the presence of uh, sarin in uh, the crater, the which uh, was uh, seen after the dropping of the air bomb, uh, we see it as uh, deficient. And this doesn't rule out uh, the presence of other scenarios, the uh, possibility. And uh, we are puzzled uh, by the fact that uh, in spite of uh, discussing uh, the explosive uh, a substance, uh, we didn't have uh, an analysis, any analysis, chemical analysis of the samples, uh, whether uh, there were residues uh, or remnants of uh, those substances. And we have uh, video and uh, uh, photos uh, taken uh, after some hours of the chemical accident. And they uh, testify uh, to the presence of sarin in the crater because after the use of these uh, chemicals there could be 30% uh, uh, of uh, these uh, substance left uh, but here we have uh, a little concentration around the crater and uh, uh, here we have a little concentration of uh, this substance so uh, the conclusion of uh, the uh, gym about the use uh, of uh, sarin hydrogen hun uh, is uh, unfounded. As uh, for my colleagues' words uh, regarding the white helmets, I would like uh, to show you a s video. Uh, just take a look. These people are digging now uh, the crater and uh, tr trying to collect something. And as a means of protection, now uh, they use uh, respirators uh, and uh, special gloves that uh, are not protecting from uh, the exposure to sarin. But uh, these people are feeling well, uh, feeling healthy. If uh, sarin were in the crater, uh, then uh, we would have a different, uh, con different picture. And uh, at, uh, we see that uh, the crater was uh, uh, formed after the detonation of uh, some projectile. Then the white helmets committed their manipulations and then the sarin was dispersed into this crater Otherwise, these people would have been dead. And by the way, we draw the attention of the joint investigative mechanism to this video, but they refrained from analyzing this video and from mentioning it in the report. Now, if you allow me, I would like to pass the floor to the representative of the Ministry of Trade and Industry of the Russian Federation. This ministry is Russian National Authority, which is responsible for implementation of the Convention on the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mikhail, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. First of all, I would like to say that our assessment on the report of Jim are quite close to those that were presented by the Minister of Defense. As concerns the chemical aspect of the report, it is our view that it is the most contradictory and ambiguous. There are a lot of discrepancies, contradictions, and by the way, this is emphasized by the authors of the report themselves, but they don't draw attention to this. The report concludes that the prevailing scenario is the release of the air bomb from the aircraft, as a result of which sarin was dis. This is contained in paragraph 92 as a fundamental conclusion following the report. However, 
The report does not provide any convincing evidence of delivery or type of delivery, type of ammunition or type of sarin dispersal. And the bid was made on confirmation of the use of sarin in binary mode. So the final product of sarin in this particular case will be taking place in the body of the projectile. That, that is why this projectile should contain a specific device to mix the components which later shape the final product. In this case, this is a kind of a mortar with a mixer. This gadget, this device is constructed in such a way that is, it is cannot be easily destroyed. However, there have been no indications about this device, about this device having been found, any evidence whatsoever. The report also concludes that the Syrian Arab, Arab Republic is responsible for the use of sarin in Hashinhun on the 4th of April 2017. This is the last paragraph of paragraph 92. And all the words that follow in this report are given as a justification of this conclusion. In this regard, I would like to discuss the second issue which relates to the first one. This is the origin of sarin which was dispersed in Haishin Hun. This is described in 10 paragraphs of the report from 81 to 91. It should be mentioned that report number seven of the team first made an attempt to carry out the so-called attributive analysis. That is means that this is an attempt to find out, to establish the origin of the chemical agent that was used. After the Syrian site passed this information on the ways of, of getting the Syrian sarin to the OPCW and the OPCW stored the samples taken from the Syrian storage before they were destroyed at the US vessel Cape Prey, there was a wide opportunity to carry out laboratory analysis to find out all specific uh, impurities, the so-called chemical signatures, with regard to the Syrian Arab Republic. And that is exactly what the Joint Investigative Mechanism did, having ordered a special laboratory analysis within the framework of the investigation of the use of sarin in Han Hun. During this investigation, which was uh, conducted at a high professional level, and this is something we should recognize, they found a, an um, impurity which preserves after binary sarin sarin is produced from DF, and my colleague from the Defense Ministry spoke in great detail about the chemical aspect of this process. Unfortunately, we also believe, and un it is unfortunate that we have no data about which concentration and at which stages this uh, component is present. The report mentions none of this. Other anyway, we believe that this is a micro impurity of phosphorus hexafluoride, which was uh, identified thanks to high sensitivity of devices and which became a certain marker and a and something that allowed to connect the first project and the final product, the DF and binary sarin of Syrian origin, which allowed to establish a correlation between the used chemical agent and the declared uh, stockpiles of DEF. Unfortunately, the establishment of probability of the presence of this micro impurity in DEF was left behind. In another process where DF is used uh, in the production of sarin, probably it was present, but no attention was paid to it since there was no need for this. So the question remains whether this chemical marker is present or not during traditional production of sarin or whether it is specific for the Syrian DF production only. Unfortunately, these questions will remain unanswered, uh, probably because other states that had DF in their stockpile as a component for binary sarin destroyed it, leaving no samples that could be used for such studies and such analysis. Uh, I would also like to mention a few words uh, about the unofficial production uh, of 
Sarin. Unfortunately, this report does not consider such a possibility. This report did not make it clear what analysis of these samples were taken as a foundation of the conclusions uh, mentioned in the report. As we understand, the team received the and this is of the samples received by the find, fact finding mission on the use of chemical weapons in Syria. They were received from the Syrian Arab Republic and from France, and quite probably from Great Britain, US, and Turkey. Our experts have studied the results of the sample analysis carried out in f by France in particular, and they arrived at the conclusion that the possibility of makeshift production of sarin cannot be ruled out. In particular, judging by those samples that have been analyzed by France, the results of this analysis have been analyzed by us. It was established that four samples, four environmental samples have been analyzed, as well as two biomedicinal pro probes, blood plasma. When analyzing environmental samples, the presence of a chemical agent was established in three cases, which could speak to the makeshift production or non-industrial production of sarin and the presence of sodium hexafluorophosphate. I don't want to overload you with chemical and technical details. And to conclude, I would like to say that as we believe the uh, investigation of probe into the use of chemical weapons requires uh, the arrival of specialists on support in due time to establish the facts of the use of chemical weapons and to, to gather the material evidence. And in this regard, the stubborn unwillingness of Jim to visit this site in order to collect samples just based on the fact that nothing can be found a long time afterwards, the act cannot be justified in our view. From the point of view of chemical identification, I must say that devices are so sensitive nowadays that the trade amounts of the chemical agent can be found even after a long time since the accident. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Helena. I would like to say a couple of words in conclusion of this briefing. So, dear guests, you've just seen and you've just heard that conclusions and arguments presented by joint investigative mechanisms tend to no criticism. I would like to repeat, we've tried to analyze all three main blocks of the report made by the Joint Investigate Mechanism, the aviation version, the crater analysis, and the chemical aspect. As concerns the aviation version, let me repeat, the Syrian aircraft Su-22 had no technical capability of dropping a bomb on Haishin Hun. As pertains to the crater, we were lucky to some extent that both the mechanism and we have the same evidence. These are photos and videos taken from internet. Neither we nor the gym visited the site of this accident. So in this particular context, we stand on the same equal footing. The only thing that we have different in this regard is the purity of the analysis of the facts. So let me once again emphasize, if this had been an air bomb, then in 100% of cases, there would have been left in the crater the tail fins of the bomb, as well as some impurities, as has been mentioned uh, by Yelena. There had been no traits found in the crater. However, the nature of this crater speaks very frankly to the fact that fighters exploded munitions on the asphalt. And judging by the video that we showed to you, 
most probably there was an explosion first, then there have been some manipulations carried out in the crater, and then sarin was added into this crater. Why? The Joint Investigative me Mechanism did not even attempt to analyze this. Why? It refused all other versions. I don't understand this. And I would also like to add one more point. As it follows from the report, the over the last year, the mechanism has done absolutely nothing to carry out its anti-terrorist mission that was mandated to it by the Security Council when its mandate was extended in November 2016. So it turns out that assisting the fight against chemical terrorism was something the regime did not find time for. It seems that they've used all of their forces to confirm the version of the Syria using the sarin in the air bomb. At the same time, I would like to mention one positive thing about the report. It is for the first time that the international structure dared to recognize that something that has been done by the so-called world helmets who, as it is known, are related to Jabhat al-Nusra and security services of several foreign states. So these photos and videos taken by these white helmets that were aimed at indignating international community against Damascus were done in the most primitive way. There are a lot of discrepancies in these videos and photos that could be very easily seen with a naked eye, and it was done successfully by the doctors of Sweden organization, a human rights organization, which as far as I understand was uh, kind of persecuted and criticized harshly back at home for saying the truth. So now the joint investigative mechanism recognized something that was said by the doctors of Sweden the rescue teams from this allegedly humanitarian organization White Helmets have overdone their job. They have set up this scene when they were alleviating the fate of people. Unfortunately, this report fails to mention one very important thing that we try to attract the attention to on numerous occasions. Many of you probably remember that in April, on April 12th, the permanent representative of the U.S. to the Security Council demonstrated a photo or photos of Syrian kids who allegedly suffered from the use of sarin. If we believe the U.S. media, those photos made Washington, contrary to the UN Charter and in contradiction to international law, to carry out a missile strike at the Sharad Air Base. So it is evident from those photos that the pupils, so those supposedly exposed to sarin child children, were contracted diluted diluted when if the sarin was used they had to be dilated so so those photos played a huge role in this hanshihun uh, story and they actually provoked massive uh, strike there so i believe that ffm and its experts had to analyze the these evidence and we have repeatedly proposed them to do so However, the F, uh, FFM um, refused to do so. Uh, there is one thing that I would like to draw your attention to. In this, this report says, and please pay some attention to them, that uh, in 57 out of 247 cases, when people requested medical help, the victims arrived to medical facilities prior to the incidents, and this incident took place from uh, 6.45 to 7.00 um, 
a.m. Uh, according to Jim. However, those people were admitted to medical facilities prior to that time, and that is uh, recorded um, in those medical facilities. However, Jim decided to play a, to turn a blind eye to this fact, uh, explaining by the cares that surrounded Han Shehun and its uh, outskirts that day. Uh, it is very difficult to accept such justification because uh, such errors could, uh, could be committed in one or three cases, but that, that is not possible for 57 out of 247 cases. And I would like to emphasize this one more time that um, 57 people were admitted to medical facilities, facilities prior to the incident. I believe that the scope of these discrepancies and errors testifies to the fact that this incident was staged. Um, and it was very, this provocation was prepared very um, badly. And I would like to say one more thing. Some of the victims um, up prior to the incidents managed in a way uh, to request medical help from a medical facilities that is 125 kilometers away from Han Shehun, so no comments here. And one more thing, uh, according to the report, the White Helmets um, uh, uh, warned about the possible use of chemical weapons prior to uh, Syrian aircraft leaving the El Shayrat Air Base. So how do they manage to know about the upcoming chemical uh, incident? So I believe that uh, we can justly ask uh, why were they so well informed about this upcoming chemical incident. So th there gives us some food for thought. In conclusion, I would like to draw attention to the following. We try to base our assumption on some hard evidence, on concrete facts that uh, we can discuss, that can be challenged. However, our opponents, uh, those who have attributed responsibility to Damascus mm, prior to an exhaustive investigation of this chemical uh, incident on the 4th of April, our uh, opponents um, usually um, mm, just uh, blurt out some uh, um, nicely sounding phrases saying about highly professional and impartial uh, manner in which the gym works. And they keep on repeating those words, impartial, independent, and highly professional. And now they also have been included in the statements of um, um, ministries of foreign affairs of many countries. And I believe that in this way, some people are trying to persuade themselves and other people that uh, those mechanisms are impartial, independent, and highly professional. However, such kind of um, statements have to be based on hard evidence and that is something that this mechanism cannot provide. We have been um, reproached that we uh, are undermining the reputation of the FF OPCW, FFM and GIM. However, we believe it to be wrong because we're trying to correct the wrong to um, some errors that have been committed by those bodies. Uh, because we believe that uh, such uh, results that we are witnessing now are completely inadmissible. And so, well, well imagine the fact that those mechanisms, the experts, have not been visiting the impact sites for many years. So can you imagine uh, such a situation, for example, if uh, police um, experts are not coming to the crime scene, it is uh, absolutely unimaginable. So how come that uh, such um, an um, influential organization uh, submits such low quality reports? 
So, uh, in conclusion, I would like to say that the materials, the outcome uh, reports uh, submitted by FFM and GIM um, are of low quality and they do not live up to the standards um, and tasks um, mandated to them. So, and now I would like to open up for the questions. Okay, please uh, present yourself before question. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. I have a question for Mr. Ulyanov. Uh, Mr. Ulyanov, please, uh, can you talk in more detail about the fact uh, why Russia decided to block the American draft resolution on extension of uh, UN OPCW uh, G mandate and what other perspectives? Thank you very much. It is a very meaningful question and uh, I would like to answer in detail to it. Oh, well, colleagues, please um, um, take a look at those uh, publications that have been issued uh, in uh, Western countries after Russia vetoing the, the U.S. draft resolution on a hasted uh, extension of uh, G mandate. We have been uh, named many names. We, uh, as if we were helping the blood regime that is killing women and children using chemical uh, warfare agents, we have been uh, called responsible for the incidents, uh, for, for the situation in Syria. And the uh, United States ambassador to the United Nations, pro well, probably uh, being a good professional, but an amateur and just a newcomer in uh, the United Nations said that uh, Russia allegedly um, um, accepts the use of chemical weapons. And uh, well, uh, they use very primitive and even dirty means to um, undermine Russia's reputation. Uh, so now to your question. The uh, Uni United Nations Security Council had, was established in 1945, and since then they have created a time-tested modalities of work. And the uh, Security Council uh, re has repeatedly extended mandates of, uh, of its different mechanisms. And always when deciding on the mandate extension, um, they issue a, a relevant report by this mechanism is issued in order to make estimations of the work carried out by this body in order to understand uh, what can be done in order, in order to improve the methods where, uh, of work of this or that body. And that is a traditional practice. That's why we insisted upon waiting uh, three or four days in order to um, uh, read this uh, report and then um, carry out a decision. It is a very basic rule of diplomacy. And I would like also to draw your attention to uh, um, an article uh, that uh, I found very interest interesting. It was a British diplomat, if I'm not mistaken, his uh, surname is Ford. Uh, he wrote, so why is Russia being criticized so heavily? It did something in line with traditional practice of the United Nations Security Council. That is something that, that is how it has to be done. But I believe that his uh, voice was silenced and un was left unheard in this um, wave of claim against Russia. And I would like to uh, draw attention to the fact that in the 2235 resolution that established the GIM, as well as um, in the resolution 2319 that extended its mandate last year, um, well, all this document says that upon the expiry of the GIM mandate, the Security Council will consider the possibility of extending its uh, mandate and as well as updating it. 
um, uh, this updating uh, is only possible uh, after analyzing the work done by this mechanism. However, up t uh, prior to 26 of October, uh, the Security Council had no information on the work carried out by the team over the uh, uh, years since November 2016, well, maybe apart from some technical and housekeeping details. And the United States proposed uh, us to um, accept such kind of uh, draft resolution without giving uh, due um, consideration to the work done by this mechanism. Uh, in other words, uh, we can say that the United States tried to prevent a very substantial analysis of the gym work prior to making a very important decision. That's why we could not uh, accept it. Uh, I should say that uh, to veto a resolution is a very difficult thing to do. And we try to refrain to it only in extreme cases. So, uh, however, the United States uh, put us in such kind of position when we w had to veto this draft resolution, and they knew this veto, veto was coming. However, they submitted this draft resolution. Why? I think it's quite um, understandable. Why? And in order to say that Russia is trying to thwart investigation of this chemical um, incident and covering um, and helping assist in this so-called blood regime by Bash al Bashar al-Assad. And now the Security Council will think on what to do next with the gym. Thank you very much for your question. Good afternoon. Um, Arabic telecommunication number one. I have two questions. One politic a political one. Uh, following up um, with the question of my colleague, um, Mr. Leonov, uh, uh, in the beginning of your statement, you said that after the GM report was issued, you are expecting a very lively debate in the Security Council as well as in the OPCW. So. Does it mean that we will witness another circle uh, of debate and that will result in another resolution or, or the, the U.S. will act um, in circumvention of uh, the Security Council resolutions? And so how is Russia going to respond to it? And uh, the second question is a technical one, well, even a medical one. Uh, probably uh, a person who's competent and professional will be able to answer it. When given your statements, you s didn't say what exactly um, this uh, report said about the injuries that those, peop those people exposed to Zarin gas. So can you say something about the nature of those injuries, of these damages to the Zarin exposure? Thank you. Uh, if I may, I will answer both of your questions, starting with the last one. You know, the whole system of investigation is based on the following model. First, the fact-finding mission should establish whether chemical weapons were used or not. And in accordance with the mandate, it should gather all the necessary information pertinent to the case. The mission calibrates the mandate itself, making it more narrow than originally stated by the directive authorities, but it has conducted the, the and gathered certain information on the victims and all the relevant information is contained in the report of the mission of the OPCW. And while uh, Jim does not go into detail and did not provide much work, it, they are only basing their findings on the report of the FFM. But as I have said, the mission was working remotely. They were working with uh, the anonymous witnesses, perhaps these people 
were somewhere on the beaches in the United Arab Emirates on the 4th of April and were never in Han Shihun. But actually, wild helmets and other hostile groups going against Damascus and uh, even uh, those from terrorist organizations brought the witnesses to the mission of the OPCW and said, here are the witnesses, they will tell you everything. And so these people w were examined in medical facilities and many were stricken by sarin, most likely. And we do not deny that because the fact of the use of sarin is uh, established. The question is who used it and how. The data of medical examinations, by, and this is indicated by the mission and, the, and by Jim, have certain discrepancies. For example, the blood tests of a certain person show the presence of sarin traces, while uh, urine samples do not give such information, and in reality this cannot happen. If a person was poisoned by sarin, the traces will be identified in the biological samples, in all biological samples. Such discrepancies uh, took place. But I repeat, uh, we cannot deny the fact of the use of sarin. Neither we nor the Americans, no one can deny that they, we have no doubts that it was used. But it is our conviction, conviction that it was used the way it was shown on the slides, as a staged performance, a provocation. According to our opponents, this was a sarin-charged air bomb, which, with which we cannot agree. I repeat, we are trying to use the facts, while our partners prefer using slogans. I think this is the principal difference. Now moving on to your first question on uh, what will come next. I don't know. I will state my personal opinion. When you read this report, you have uh, you are left with a very sad feeling. We were thinking that uh, the structure which was created with our participation would conduct serious and professional, real, genuine work. Well, we see such weak, undetailed reports, which are very easily criticized, which is, in fact, what is being done today. So, as for, prolong as for prolonging the mandate and extending it, we support the extension, because the very fact of the use of chemical weapons is absolutely unacceptable for us, as well as for many of our partners in the Security Council, I hope. But Jim should start real work. Not, it should not work the way it does now. I will have told you the story about the chlorine barrel hitting the air vent. They call it fantastic and impossible themselves. So, but they still say that Damascus is to blame. Such levels of reports are unacceptable for us, and should we extend gym mandate and we support the extension, then we should do it seriously. Enough of this. We have uh, witnessed their helpless professional work for two years, and this had very serious political implications. And uh, specifically for the journalist, I can uh, uh, tell you one episode when Jim uh, uh, said that Damascus was to blame for three cases of the use of chemical weapons last year our Western colleagues several months later at the end of February presented a project of a sanction resolution on imposing sanctions against high-ranking Syrian military officials, as well as high-ranking uh, scientists. So we ask them, what are the sanctions imposed for? They say, for the use of chemical weapons. You know, the question arises, 
Uh, are there any grounds to blame the scientists for someone using chlorine? Scientists have nothing to do with that. Chlorine production is a technical process and a rather simple one. You should not be a PhD or to produce chlorine. So we asked our Western colleagues what are the grounds to suppose that these people with the names and posts, who, which of these people are to blame for the use of chemical weapons? Show us your proof and let us examine it. They say, no, you should trust us. We know exactly that these people are to blame. Well, when we ask them for proof, they say that we won't give it. So it ended up in uh, Russia putting a veto on the resolution because someone should take care of the, res of the reputation of the Security Council. Such serious documents uh, with sanctions should not be adopted without providing any proof. And this was followed by a new wave of uh, anti-Russian sentiment in the media saying Russia supports the violent regime of Bashar Assad and uh, the use of chemical weapons and the Western colleagues who are present here. You must agree that there should be certain limits. When uh, one side is accused of deadly sins, you should provide some proof at least. So the, these are my explanations why we refuse to prolong the to extend the mandate before the report and I think our arguments are rather convincing and I explain why we could not support the sanctions against Syrian scientists. I think that from the point of view of common sense we have uh, all the grounds to do so. I understand that uh, in information war is going on and in war sometimes dirty tricks are used and very often this leaves uh, very lamentable sentiments. So the Security Council will uh, consider the extension of uh, gym mandate and I can unveil a secret. Today, well, taking into account the time zone differences in New York, we will present most likely a Russian draft resolution on the extension of gym mandate. This will be a serious draft resolution based on the detailed analysis of the accumulated experience of the last two years. It will be aimed at the elimination of the drawbacks that we have seen. This draft resolution is aimed at strengthening Jim. It will even include a paragraph with a task for the UN Secretary General and the Gen and the technical director and technical secretariat of the OPCW to present recommendations within 10 days on new steps of the organization and of Jim in the light of a new resolution. W it will also contain recommendations for the Security Council to react to these recommendations within five days. The reasons of the changes that we are going to propose consists in uh, establishing clear rules of the game. The rules are defined by the Convention on Chemical Weapons. This is the golden standard as far as counteracting the chemical threat is concerned. So we will aspire to bring the gym activities in full compliance with the high standards of the Convention. Of course, this would imply, first of all, work on the ground, on the incident side. If we conduct investigation, it should be serious. We cannot draw any conclusions from publishings in the media, and we cannot use them to say that Damascus is to blame for use of chemical weapons. This is nonsense. Even if we do investigate, let us take it seriously. So this resolution, this draft resolution, will be presented today, and uh, we hope that all those who have declared the importance of uh, extending the mandate will support us and uh, I invite all uh, uh, members of the Security Council to support and to co-author the resolution if they support the extension of the mandate and not pre the preserving of its current status. So there will be discussions on this topic as well as discussions on the report in the Security Council 
It will take place on the 7th of November, on the 100th anniversary of the Great October Socialist Revolution. And some say that uh, a new session of the Executive Council of the of the OPCW may be convened. There are talks about it currently. The Russian side, during its discussions, will proceed from the facts that have been presented by our colleagues from the Ministry of Defense, from the Ministry of Industry and Commerce. We consider the Jim report to be amateur, low-quality work, and we are ready to support our point of view in any arguments with any opponent, and uh, the findings of our colleagues in the military and in the Industry and Commerce Ministry will be brought to the attention of the UN Security Council, and th they will be taken into consideration when elaborating our future steps. Thank you. Any more questions? You know, my c colleagues, this report of Jim contains numerous references to certain military research centers and so-called independent experts. Who are these independent experts? I don't know. If they get any salary, they are not independent anymore. It contains no names, no names of organizations. And uh, as I understand, this is connected with the fact that this information is considered sensible, sensitive. The same goes for the Russian military. Uh, off the mic. That's exactly what I'm talking about. And here I have representatives of the m defen of the defense ministry and. Uh, Knowing my name is enough for you, as for the representatives of the Defense Ministry, well, they are not inclined, due to their professional responsibilities, to, to self-promotion. But, well, yes, the names can be read on their uniform. But I'm afraid that we cannot go any further than that. Any more questions? Are there any more questions, colleagues? Here we have one. Dario Cherenik, Rossi, Sivunia, and Sputnik Radio. Uh, the organization, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, back in 2015 reported the uh, full elimination and destruction of all chemical weapons and components that Damascus possessed in the territory that the Syrian army controlled. That Damascus had f fully complied with its obligations assumed after its admission to the organization. So how do you explain the current appearance of chemical weapons in by Damascus? The opponents uh, of Damascus explained this by the fact that the Syrian authorities uh, had not declared all the reserves and had hidden something for the rainy day. And sometimes uh, they use it f against the opponents. You know, have repeatedly asked myself if it is possible or not. Me personally, I do not understand why Damascus uh, has uh, used chemical weapons. If it has done so, it is uh, uh, self uh, uh, destruction. And as for the accident that we know, uh, these uh, weapons are used uh, far from the front line and uh, it is used uh, in uh, at a massive scale then there would that would not make any sense and the use of chemical weapons is uh, connected to to the accusations regarding Damascus that it uh, kills uh, children and women and uh, committing the uh, strikes. If it's, if it's just an absurdity, it doesn't make sense. It is harmful for Damascus, and it has no advantage in uh, stating so. And who I will win from that? The opposition. And uh, 
they think that after some accident, another country will uh, uh, deliver such a strike. So uh, this is uh, a thing that cannot be uh, seen distinctly. As for uh, the declaration, we have some uh, claims uh, regarding Syria. And uh, not only about the declaration of uh, the use of declaration. As for the the claims towards declaration, they can be used as political instruments of uh, exercising pressure on Damascus. You know that Damascus joined the convention under the conditions uh, of uh, fighting terrorism, uh, the internal opposition, and in a month uh, it had to elaborate a declaration on uh, the weapons uh, it had eliminated before 2013. And uh, I do not rule out there could be some discrepancies. I think it's a normal thing, and many countries uh, uh, finalized their uh, uh, declarations. Uh, they did it uh, under normal conditions and not uh, in uh, under host military hostilities. So there are some mechanisms uh, to eliminate these discrepancies. And uh, we should use them, uh, and they are technical, but they are usually politicized. You know that in uh, 20 years, the OPCW has uh, always uh, made decisions by consensus. This is uh, a perfect culture of dialogue and using mutually beneficial decisions. As for the Syrian profile, the organization has split. And uh, this is a rule uh, that the decisions are made uh, by voting. And uh, there is uh, sometimes a split, 50-50 split. Some 50% uh, vote for something, some 50% abstain. And uh, this is a concern uh, for many member states of the OPCW, and they call for depoliticizing uh, the work. And the secretary, uh, the uh, director general, Mr. Gonzalez, has been uh, elected, and uh, during his uh, electoral campaign, as well as uh, many other candidates, stressed that uh, uh, after being elected on this post, he would try to dip politicize uh, the work of the OPCW, and we agree totally with these stance, and we hope that it will, be ha will happen that way. Thank you. Do you have any more questions? Yes, please. We have discussed the topic. Yeah. Please, Anastasia. Good afternoon, uh, Japanese uh, Broadcasting Agency, Anastasia. Uh, maybe my question would seem a bit naive. As uh, for the gym experts, they didn't uh, take the samples uh, on site. Uh, they uh, refused uh, during to some due to some instructions, and the Russian experts, neither uh, do they uh, did they take uh, those samples? They were provided to them. Uh, so could uh, the conclusions and the discrepancies uh, be due to different uh, samples that uh, those experts had? We, our country, doesn't have uh, such samples. And uh, Jim received not uh, sample about the information and the results about the analysis. Uh, that were uh, transferred uh, to the fact-finding mission by the opposing uh, groupings. And there are many questions. Uh, we were tell, told that uh, the re report doesn't contain uh, all the information necessary for uh, the objective assessment, doesn't contain uh, uh, the results. And we have uh, many questions. 
if we have had a professional analysis uh, and a professional report, this information is not a secret one. We can uh, have classified names, uh, but uh, the results of the analysis uh, th should be open. If uh, this information had been included in the report, then uh, we w could have said many more things about their material. So these uh, those materials uh, is uh, hidden uh, by Jim, and it testifies to the low quality of the report. And I have an impression that people are covering themselves by the names of uh, the very respected organizations like the OPCW that got the Nobel Prize uh, for Peace and uh, the United Nations. If you act under the cover of such organizations, then uh, the quality, according to them, doesn't mean much. But it, I don't know, but it looks that way. I'm not sure if I answered your question or not. Do you understand rightly that we do not know who had taken those samples and the conclusion was drawn according to the conclusion of some unknown people? I would say that a number of countries, first of all the United States, uh, Great Britain, made their conclusions before uh, the sampling procedure, before the investigation, and on the 4th of October, not only these countries and a number of others declared that Damascus is to was to blame. You know a uh, fa famous uh, story by Krylov. Uh, this is uh, the thing that uh, happened in this case. Damascus is always to blame. As for the others, uh, for the Russian Federation, we recognized uh, the use of sarin in Hashnikhum. After the supporters of Damascus uh, staying in that uh, city could uh, uh, get uh, in secret those samples and uh, transfer them to Damascus for analysis. And Damascus confirmed that uh, the analysis proves uh, the existence of the presence of sarin, and uh, this information was transferred to the OPCW. And if the white helmets uh, got the uh, samples and they uh, handed them over, and uh, there was uh, uh, the results uh, coincided with the Syrian authorities, then of course uh, we agree that sarin uh, was uh, used, but from the professional point of view, from the pr point of view of the Convention for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, it is not uh, an adequate thing. And international f um, officials should themselves uh, take uh, the samples and uh, store them uh, for the transportation, in transportation to the certified laboratory. This is ABC of uh, our professional practice. And the OPCW has uh, a special document of the chain of custody. And uh, Jim and a fact finding mission, do they do not follow these principles for some years now. And uh, it's outrageous that they do not only have uh, on site uh, inspections but rather that they do not go to those places when they have all the conditions provided. Uh, provided. Look at Shirat, uh, the United States. It is uh, a big power uh, that has declared m repeatedly that uh, they have all the information and uh, reliable information that uh, the sarin is stored on the at the air base. Uh, what should be done in that case? As uh, th what at the initiative of uh, the very state, uh, they should uh, get the consent of uh, the Syrian authorities, 
and uh, to gather samples uh, at the air base on its territory and to see, to determine whether sarin uh, was present at that site or not. This is a professional obligation and what do we see instead? Syrians uh, say that you can come and we will uh, provide an unfettered access to you. And we insist that this should be done. But instead, we are told that this is not the mandate of uh, them. Uh, so just uh, go to uh, the International J Court of Justice. On the 8th of uh, October, uh, one of the uh, deputy heads of uh, the mechanism uh, visited that place, uh, accompanied by uh, three experts in chemistry from the OPCW. So uh, that's a wonderful occasion to collect the samples, but they refused saying that they do not have any instruction from the uh, leadership and they would not do them do this independently and gym leadership said that they should not take the samples is it a normal situation and uh, do we have to extend the mandate of uh, this mechanism if it uh, allows itself to uh, permits its efforts to do this Yes, please. At Russia Today, at TV channel. Uh, how do you see the composition of, uh, of these uh, bodies? And uh, would be the reform of the gym uh, will be conducted? Uh, thank you. This is another problem that we have. Uh, and with not speak about Jim, but the fact finding mission. 102, 100 and, uh, or one uh, uh, chapter of uh, the U UN Charter uh, says uh, uh, that uh, that uh, these uh, things could be done at the wider uh, geographical basis, uh, and uh, the same thing. Uh, uh, is uh, in the charter of the OPCW. So we speak about the balanced uh, uh, territorial uh, intercomposition. And uh, this is uh, a condition uh, for objectivity and for unbiased approach. Uh, when uh, uh, the UN Security Council uh, res uh, approved a resolution uh, about the establishment of uh, the gym, it included a clause uh, about uh, the equal representation. And uh, as for gym, uh, they have a normal procedure in that, but they uh, have some uh, discrimination. Uh, and uh, former Secretary General of the UN uh, said that uh, permanent uh, members could not work uh, in this uh, organization. It can be understood, but uh, in the fact-finding mission, uh, the uh, composition of its membership uh, is in secret. Uh, in March, uh, we could uh, learn uh, the this uh, composition, and uh, we learned uh, that only Western countries are represented uh, in that body. So were there no experts in other regions? Why, why is such a composition? And as I have told you that there are no representatives of permanent of P5 in the gym, uh, and but there are no Russians, Chinese, uh, in uh, the FFM, th however, there are many Americans, and the most important thing that the FFM is headed by two British citizens. I think that is quite a challenge, because in all international o organizations, it's done in a different way. They try to base their decisions on a wider geographic diversity. Uh, well, I believe that those two British gentlemen are influential chemists. However, uh, there are two heads, and both 
both of them are British and taking into account that the United Kingdom is not completely impartial in this regard because the United Kingdom has taken on a quite negative stance uh, to uh, the Syrian authorities. So, so how does it happen? I do not quite understand it. That's why I believe that when submitting our draft resolution, we will remind our colleagues there are some rules of conduct that we should stick to, and we hope that we will be heard. Thank you. So any other questions? No?